The first item of business is portfolio questions, and we'll go first to finance, economy and fair work. Question number one, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact will be on Dumfries and Galloway Council of the UK Government's decision to publish its budget on the same day that local authorities in Scotland must legally set their rates of council tax. Kate Forbes. Well, the impact would have been very damaging if it hadn't been for the decision by the Scottish Government to bring forward the Scottish budget. Certainly, the decision demonstrates the UK Government's ignorance of the budget process in Scotland. Uh, the lack of engagement by the UK Government has, isn't just unacceptable to the Scottish Government, but also to every local authority and the citizens who depend on our public services. Emma Harper. I thank the Minister for that response. The UK Government's decision to push back the UK budget to the 11th of March is causing major uncertainty for both the Scottish Government and local authorities. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree, or does the Minister agree, that this uncertainty could be altogether avoided if Scotland had had full fiscal powers of an independent country? Kate Forbes. Well, I think I and the Cabinet Secretary <laughs> both agree with yeah. that. Independence would, of course, give us control over our budget planning and would provide the necessary economic levers to grow the Scottish economy. But as I said, in the face of uncertainty this year, the Scottish Government will present its budget at the earliest practical date, which is uh, tomorrow. And we will do so in full recognition that it's vital to give local authorities, including Dumfries and Galloway, the um, security and the clarity it needs on its budgets as early as possible, unlike the UK Government. Supplementary from Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister expressed concern in her answer that she doesn't believe they have sufficient information from the UK Government. Does she have enough information to bring forward, for the Finance Secretary, to bring forward a budget, but also to allow local government to set theirs on the date that the UK Government sets it? Or should we expect in-year revisions? And if so, when will those in-year revisions be announced? Kate we, Forbes. we are basing our budget on um, the best available estimates in order to give that clarity to yeah. local government. And we have intentionally, in order to assist local authorities with their budget preparations, we, the Cabinet Secretary already announced on the 31st of January, for example, that the local government settlement will include information that it will include confirmation that local authorities will again have flexibility to increase their council tax mm. levels by up to 3% in real terms. So that demonstrates our willingness to try and use the best available estimates that we have, our own budget process, to give that clarity to local authorities. Question number two, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports small businesses in Cope Bridge and Chrysler. Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government supports businesses across Scotland via a range of interventions delivered through our enterprise and skills agencies, business gateway, and through other inclusive measures like business improvement districts and city region deals. Regeneration has been a key focus in Cope Bridge. For example, through the Regeneration Capital Fund grant, over £1 million funding has transformed the former Luggy Glen sewage work site into the Drumpelier Business Park, a flagship centre for startups, SMEs and social enterprises. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Minister for that response. He'll be aware from his own uh, constituency work as well that last week North Lanarkshire Labour confirmed they will be imposing parking charges on people looking to shop in Coatbridge Town Centre as well as in the villages of Steps and Christ in my constituency. Now I'm all for a, a phased environmental strategy uh, in the local area but given that many businesses are already struggling due to the close proximity of Glasgow Fort Shopping Centre with its free parking as well as online shopping does the Minister agree with me that this is a wrong decision which could bring further detriment to small and local businesses in my constituency? Jamie Hepburn. Well, as uh, Mr McGregor uh, alluded to, uh, Presiding Officer, I, of course, represent the uh, constituency adjacent to his, so this is a matter I am well aware of. Uh, and my capacity as Scottish Government Minister, I should, of course, say that this is a matter for North Lanarkshire Council uh, to deal with uh, in my capacity as a constituency representative, of course, I am exploring it in terms of my own constituency interest. Question number three, Johan Lamont. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what representations it has had, had from Glasgow City Council regarding local government funding. Kate Forbes. Well, ministers and officials regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including Glasgow City Council, to discuss a range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. 
Joanne Lamont. The Minister may be aware that last month Glasgow SNP councillors sought and failed to defeat a Labour motion demanding that the council leader Susan Aitken make direct and public representation seeking fair funding for the city. Can the Minister confirm whether she has been receipt of these representations? Because, of course, while trying to avoid standing up for Glasgow, the SNP at the same time is bringing forward proposals for severe cuts to services which will make real Glasgow's funding crisis. Closing community centres and libraries, getting rid of golf courses are only part of this dereliction of duty to Glasgow citizens. So will the minister listen to the grave concerns? Will the minister listen to the grave concerns of charities, unions and communities and all those who do want to stand up for Glasgow and produce a budget that understands the needs of Glasgow and the severe consequences for all too many families of the, if the current plans go ahead? Kate Forbes. Well, Susan Aitken is a great champion of Glasgow and the member yeah. knows full well yeah. that the biggest budget pressures faced by Glasgow City Council at the moment are entirely of her party's making in yeah. terms of the equal pay yeah. settlement. Yeah. But yeah. the SNP in Glasgow City Council and the SNP in this government will continue to stand up for Glasgow yeah. as they have done demonstrably in the last few months. Can I have short supplementaries, please, Murdo Fraser and then Shona Robson. Murdo uh, Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Along with Glasgow City Council, Authorities across Scotland have seen savage real-term cuts to their core funding under this SNP government. With the block grant for the coming year from Westminster increasing by at least £1.1 billion in real terms, would the uh, Minister agree there could be no case please. for any further cuts to local government spending? That is not really relevant to the question, but if the Minister would like to respond, she's very welcome. All I can Keep say is that I look forward to the day that the UK Government reverses a whole decade of austerity that Scottish yeah. public services have yeah. suffered under the Conservatives. Shona Robson. The Chancellor of the Exchequer's decision to increase the rate of borrowing from the Public Works Loan Board by 1% will be detrimental to Scotland's Council's ability to carry out essential infrastructure projects. Does the Minister agree that the UK Government should urgently rethink this decision and engage with the Scottish Government and local authorities on this matter? Kate Forbes. I fully agree with Shona Robinson and I've written um, twice to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury on that matter. The decision that was taken about um, loan funding was directly taken in light of decisions around English local authorities and not Scottish, Scottish local authorities and it will have a direct impact on infrastructure spend in Scotland. Uh, could members please note that supplementary questions should be relevant to the original question asked? Going to question number four, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the cumulative percentage divergence has been between total GDP growth in the Scottish and UK economies since May 2007. Derek Mackay. Well, since the second quarter of 2007, Scotland's GDP has grown by a total of 10.3%, whilst GDP for the UK as a whole has increased by 15.2%. However, the majority of this divergence can be explained by the fact that Scotland's population has grown more slowly than the UK's since 2007. Scotland's population has grown by 5% and the UK population by 8%. So this demonstrates why we've called for immigration powers to be devolved with the introduction of a Scottish visa to allow Scotland to attract and retain people with the skills and qualities for our communities and our economy to flourish. A refreshed economic action plan sets out how we'll tackle the climate emergency, grow an inclusive economy and face up to the challenges of Brexit, changing demographics and shifting global circumstances. Dean Lockhart. Uh, Derek Mackay has just confirmed that the Scottish economy is 5% smaller, that's £7 billion smaller than it should be after 13 years of SNP government. That's £7 billion of econo economic growth that could have generated thousands of jobs and hundreds of millions of pounds in extra tax for public spending in Scotland. We listened to the SNP blame Brexit for this economic stagnation, but it's been going on for 13 years. And last year, the Scottish economy grew less than half the rate of the UK. So let me ask the Cabinet Secretary, when will he start to listen to leading business organisations across Scotland and change the direction of his economic policy? Derek Mackay. Well, when it comes to listening to the business community, uh, the Tories have absolutely ignored the business community in relation to Brexit, which is about to destroy the economic credentials of the Tories if they had any to start with. In terms of the last 13 years, I made the point that the divergence in GDP is largely down to population. 
and like with other macroeconomic matters, who controls population, who controls migration? It's the UK government that does these things, and that is the primary reason for that divergence. But when it comes to areas that the Scottish Government does have a lead on, we have been outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom on other economic indicators such as attractiveness. Scotland is second only to London and southeast of England. On exports, we're outperforming the rest of the UK. On unemployment, for many quarters, it's been lower than the rest of the UK and is currently the same as the UK. And on GDP growth, when the Tories were predicting recession, we've been delivering growth for our economy. And the greatest threat to Scotland's economy right now is Brexit, which has all been delivered at the hands of this chaotic, incompetent and inept Tory government. Everybody's getting a bit nippy today. Could we, <laughs> could we tone it down for the rest of the session, please? Question number five, Jamie Green. I'll do my best, uh, presiding officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how much time and money it plans to spend producing an alternative to the Jers figures. Derek Mackay. I'm sure this will tone it down, uh, presiding officer. The GELS publication explicitly states that it shows Scotland's position within the UK and not as an independent nation, as the UK government increasingly disregards the democratic wishes of the people of Scotland. It's more important than ever that we complete the necessary steps to hold a referendum on independence. The Scottish Government produced a comprehensive plan for an independent Scotland in 2014, and as we set out in our programme for government, will undertake the necessary work to update that plan and ensure that the people of Scotland have the information they need to make an informed choice over the future of their country. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Uh, never mind uh, uh, the relevance of Southbound entries. The answer wasn't even relevant to the question, I'm afraid, uh, presiding officer. I asked how much time and money will be spent by civil servants producing uh, these uh, figures. Last month, the Cabinet Secretary said he wanted to produce alternative JERS because he feels, and I quote, frustrated when the JERS are published every year. Cabinet Secretary, why are you so frustrated with these independent figures? And which impartial economic authority will independently verify your figures when you produce them? Derek McKay. Well, I'll always expect the um, civil service to act in the professional and impartial fashion that they do. I dare say that our work, though, will be of much greater value than the uh, speculation around the UK government spending £5 million on propaganda telling us how great uh, the union is at this point in time, which is uh, very interesting coming from the, the Conservatives in Westminster. But in, a, in essence, I've said we want Excuse a, a Excuse me, well Cabinet informed... Secretary. This is just getting over rude, and I'm really not appreciating it, and it's neither funny. So please, Mr Mackay, if you would... Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'd simply make the point that uh, we uh, want an informed debate around the future of our country. I've never challenged the impartiality of our statisticians. What I have found uh, frustrating is the misrepresentation, actually, of figures as they relate to Scotland, when people misrepresent jails as trying to suggest that it would reflect the the potential of an independent Scotland when it doesn't make any such suggestion. It is not the reflection of an independent Scotland or its potential. It's the estimated notional position uh, within the current constitutional position. And I think it's right and fair that we have an informed debate about the options for our country and that that is based on fact and the wonderful potential that Scotland has. And we'll preserve the calm with a short supplementary from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I bring peace and love. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree it is sheer hypocrisy for Tory MSPs to criticise this government for trying to improve the accuracy of government expenditure and revenue Scotland figures when the UK government they so slavishly support will spend £5 million of taxpayers' money on a campaign to highlight the alleged benefits of the union to the people of Scotland. Derek Mackay. Uh, yes, I do agree with Kenny Gibson that that £5 million would indeed be a waste of taxpayers' uh, money, whereas what we have been uh, working on is a fully informed rational debate about the future of our nation, and it should be facts-based, much better than the likes of the campaign that we saw uh, from the, the Leave campaign in relation to Brexit. In Scotland, we just have a mature, responsible and decent debate about the future of our country that is based on the facts of how rich our country is but could be even fairer with the powers of independence. Question number six, Angela Codson. 
to ask the Scottish Government how it supports jobs, business and economic growth in West Lothian. Jamie Hepburn. West Lothian has benefited from a range of projects designed to promote investment and create jobs, including a £2 million investment in Livingston Trade Park from the Building Scotland Fund and £1.8 million from the Town Centre Fund, which is supporting 112 projects. In addition, during 2018-19, over 1,400 West Lothian companies were helped through Business Gateway, around 1,000 modern apprenticeships were supported, and Scottish Enterprise provided £2.3 million in R&D and innovation grants. Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister is well aware that API Foils Limited in Livingston have went into administration, leaving over 100 workers to an uncertain future. So how will the Scottish Government help secure the site and jobs for the future, ensure API workers get full support, including their full entitlements to redundancy and pensions? Jamie Hepburn. It, can I thank uh, Angela Constance for the question? Of course, I had the opportunity to meet with her uh, yesterday to discuss some of these matters, and if she should require to, to meet with me again to discuss them further, I'll be happy to do that. Right now, uh, our priority is to ensure that the, the workforce is, is supported in the immediate term. So, uh, our Partnership Action for Continuing Employment team attended the announcement of administration on Monday. There is a pay support event uh, today in West Lothian. A college uh, to which the Unite the Union will be uh, in attendance uh, as well. If there should be any delays with individuals receiving payments from the redundancy payment service, I, I have uh, offered to intervene. I hope that isn't necessary, but where it is, I will readily do so. So, our immediate priority is to support the workforce. Thereafter, our other priority is to uh, support the acquisition of API foils as a going concern, and I can assure uh, Angela Constant, the rest of the chamber. That's a matter to which my attention is turned and that of Scottish Enterprise as well. Question number seven, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how it supports inclusive growth in the Mid Fife and Glenrothes constituency. Ivan McKee. In addition to the reopening of the Leavenmouth Rail Link, Glenrothes and Mid Fife will benefit from a £450 million investment in two city region deals Edinburgh and South East Scotland, and also the Taste City deal. The Edinburgh deal is already delivering benefits. Construction will start soon on nine new business units in Glenrothes as part of the £35 million Scottish Government investment in the deal's I3 programme, which supports industrial innovation. We continue to press the UK Government to sign the TAE deal as a matter of urgency. Jenny Colruth. I thank the Minister for that response. The DPS group based in Glenrothes are one of the UK's only uh, integrated electrical instrumentation and control system providers who support businesses globally and closer to home, including the bespoke lighting and electrical systems that are used for the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo. Given the importance of this local employer in my constituency, would the Minister like to join me in Glenrothes to visit DPS and to learn more about their valuable work? Yeah. Ivan McKee. Uh, as the member may be aware, um, I spent a considerable amount of time uh, travelling around the country visiting innovative businesses to understand the great technology that Scotland has to offer and how the Scottish Government can support businesses to internationalise that, uh, that technology. And I'd be delighted to join the member in her constituency to visit this business and understand what they can contribute to Scotland's strong economy. Question number eight, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how much revenue has been raised by the Large Business Supplement since 2016. Kate Forbes. The Large Business Supplement has raised £510 million since 2016-17, and the Scottish Government has committed to reviewing the level of the Large Business Supplement at each future budget in light of affordability. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that response. However, businesses in my region and across Scotland are still being put at a competitive disadvantage thanks to the large business supplement. With the budget just around the corner, will the government commit now to ensure that Scottish businesses aren't held back? Kate Forbes. Well, frankly, that isn't true. In fact, Scotland offers a very competitive tax uh, environment with um, support for uh, the business growth accelerator, nursery relief, renewables relief, and a number of other reliefs. And I'm so delighted, uh, presiding officer, that we're still able to provide those reliefs after yesterday's uh, vote. But either way, the budget is tomorrow and look forward to the Tories' continued engagement in that process. That concludes questions on the finance economy and fair work portfolio and we'll move on to the next set of questions.
The second portfolio is Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, and I'd remind members that questions five and seven are grouped together. So any member who wishes to ask a supplementary in either of these questions should press the request to speak button in the usual way. Question number one, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how it plans to encourage representations from countries in the Global South when Scotland ho hosts COP26 in November. Rosanna Cunningham. It is important that COP26 is inclusive and includes representatives from the Global South who are amongst those least responsible for the global climate emergency but are being affected first and most severely by it. The Scottish Government will seek to develop a programme of opportunities where all voices can be heard in a respectful and collaborative way. We will also encourage the UK Government to ensure the process of securing visas is as easy as possible and that delegates from around the world are able to attend COP26. Bill Kidd. Thank you, and I'm sure we all welcome the First Minister's tweet yesterday making clear her intention to make COP26 a success. Nonetheless, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that Boris Johnson's reported hostility to the role of the Scottish Government in co-hosting this global event is counterproductive, particularly when tackling climate change requires collaboration of all communities, whether it be Scotland or vulnerable peoples in areas such as the Pacific Islands? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, the world is facing a climate emergency and we must now move to a net zero future in a way that is fair and just. COP26 can set us on this course, but it has to be a shared endeavour and we're determined that political differences will not play any part of it. The Scottish Government has continually demonstrated our commitment to delivering a successful COP26 in partnership and collaboration with the UK Government, Glasgow City Council, Police Scotland and others. And the First Minister yesterday wrote to the Prime Minister to reiterate this commitment. Supplementary from Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And um, I'm heartened by the Cabinet Secretary's response uh, to Bill Kidd's question. And does she agree with me that the, as the UK moves rapidly towards hosting COP26, the Prime Minister would do well to take a lesson from the effective way that the Scottish Government and our Parliament develop the Climate Change Scotland Act, cross-party and beyond? Surely if we can't cooperate across the UK as hosts, what hope is there for the Global South? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, I, I thank Claudia Beamish uh, for her question. Uh, COP26 in Glasgow does have the potential to be a very significant moment in our global efforts to uh, tackle the climate crisis. And I can uh, assure people that are, uh, you know, globally folk are looking forward very much to this e event. Um, and uh, I think it's really important that this is not going to end up being about political differences because on climate change there is a huge degree uh, of, of cross-party collaboration not just here uh, in fairness the UK government is also uh, one of those countries in the world prepared to commit to a net zero target date many countries don't I think we should be in the business of celebrating the progress that we're making uh, and not uh, getting ourselves into a wrangle uh, which will do the opposite question number two Willie Coffey Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what the greatest challenges are in Scotland in tackling the climate emergency. Rosanna Cunningham. We have responded to the global climate change emergency by committing to world leading emissions reduction targets. Our challenge now is to adopt policies that make achieving those targets a reality. And work is, of course, underway now to produce an update of our climate change plan in April. But the committee has also been clear. Achieving uh, Scotland's, that's the Committee on Climate Change, has, also, has been clear, achieving Scotland's net zero target is a collective endeavour, and that goes back to the earlier question, and is contingent not least on the UK Government, who the committee challenged to, and I quote, step up and match Scottish policy ambition in areas where key powers are reserved. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Evidence from Scottish Renewables presented yesterday at our economy committee told us that Scotland leads the way in low carbon electricity charging for electric vehicles at only 50 grams of CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour compared to 200 grams in the UK. 
and with a little more support, Scotland's EV drivers could soon be almost totally carbon free. What more can the Cabinet Secretary do to push this forward, which would make a huge contribution to tackle climate change in Scotland? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, we have invested over £30 million of funding since 2012 into developing the publicly available charging network in Scotland and now have over 1,200 charge points, including 275 rapid chargers. But we are committed to continuing to expand this network until 2022 and in June last year announced £20 million of funding through our Switched On Towns and Cities and local authority support programmes to have a further 500 charge points installed across Scotland. We will continue to offer further funding opportunities to local authorities, households and business to assist the growth of the charging network. Uh, and I will make sure to draw my colleague Michael Matheson's attention to this question. Supplementary from Morris Golden. Uh, thank you. The SNP are set to miss a range of climate change targets this year. They will fall short with one in six biodiversity targets. Progress on active travel has actually declined and all public sector vehicles were supposed to be using alternative fuel by now. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether she t still intends to fulfil any targets missed this year? And if so, when? Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government continues to be as ambitious as it possibly can be in respect of a whole range of issues in the climate change portfolio, as the member knows particularly well. Um, we are uh, progressing. Uh, we are doing better than a vast number of countries in the world. We're one of the global leaders in this area. And I may say that we are well in advance of the rest of our colleagues in the rest of the United Kingdom. Question number three, Richard Lyle. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it is having with food and drink manufacturers regarding their use of plastic packaging. Rosanna Cunningham. For Scotland to become a uh, net zero society uh, will require long-term and sustainable changes to consumer and producer behaviour. We've engaged with food and drink manufacturers on a number of policy initiatives, most recently our Circular Economy Bill proposals and the Deposit Return Scheme for Drinks Containers. We're also working with DEFRA and other nations of the UK on a new approach to extended producer responsibility for all packaging. Our aim is that this will provide stronger incentives to reduce waste and use more sustainable packaging across a wide range of products. Richard Lyle. I can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? The Cabinet Secretary may be aware of a recent announcement by Tesco stores of a major step where they are taking to remove multi-pack pa plastic packaging. This is a welcome announcement. I would be grateful to hear from the Cabinet Secretary what discussions could take place with other large retailers and grocery stores to reduce their plastic use. Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I welcome uh, all steps taken by uh, big stores, particularly uh, the giant supermarkets, because they have a, a potential to make quite a big impact into this area. Um, we are engaging with the grocery supply chain, including retailers, through the UK Plastics Pact. Uh, this is a voluntary commitment, uh, setting ambitious targets for signatories to reduce the amount of plastic packaging they use and to work to improve their environmental impact. Uh, and that work is ongoing and will continue to be ongoing until we achieve uh, what we want to see. Supplementary from Finlay Carson. Uh, whilst there is widespread support for a DRS system, including on these benches, there remains significant concern over the timescales for its introduction, if not part of a UK-wide scheme. Given that in 2015 Northern Ireland concluded that, although desirable, it was not feasible to introduce the scheme on a Northern Ireland basis, and in 2017 the Welsh Government also concluded it would be preferable to establish a UK-wide scheme, can the Cabinet Secretary um, tell us why she's so determined to introduce the scheme on a Scotland-only uh, basis uh, when it will bring additional costs and disruption to businesses when DEVRA has consulted uh, on a scheme com covering England, Wales and Northern Ireland, which should commence in 2023? Rosanna Cunningham. I, I think it might have been advisable for Finlay Carson to have uh, put the word allegedly in before the word commenced there because at the moment uh, there is no real uh, certainty about when uh, that will proceed. Uh, and uh, frankly, um, this is an area in which we have devolved responsibility. We can do things in Scotland. Uh, I'm surprised that the Conservatives, who are constantly asking us to get on with doing things in the devolved arena, somehow object to it when it actually happens in practice. Question number four, Mark Ruskell. To ask the Scottish Government when the Environment Secretary last met communities living near the natural gas and ethylene plants at Moss Moran in Fife. 
Rosanna Cunningham. I am receiving regular updates on developments at Mossmorin, and officials are in very regular contact with SEPA and others who have statutory responsibilities in relation to the plant. I appreciate the concerns of local communities following uh, uh, repeated unplanned flaring events during the past few years and have been clear that the situation needs to improve. I've been equally clear, however, that specific regulatory and enforcement actions are for SEPA to consider in its role as an independent regulator. Mark Ruskell. Well, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? I mean, of course, I recognise the plans and the regulatory action that SEPA have taken to ensure that the, the plant actually operates within the law and ends the misery of communities in the surrounding area. But none of these actions actually address the climate emergency and Moss Moran remains the second largest emitter of carbon in Scotland. Given that there will be a climate camp this summer near Moss Moran, ahead of COP26, bringing together protesters in the local community, will the Cabinet Secretary be prepared to convene a round table of the plant operators, the community and others, to plot ahead about how this plant can decarbonise? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I'm always prepared to uh, consider uh, uh, what might be helpful uh, interventions. Uh, I should, of course, uh, uh, point out that the issue of Moss Morin uh, is a cross-portfolio one, and I, that would have to be uh, done on a multi-portfolio basis. Um, the, the climate camp, uh, I am aware of that, um, uh, but there is, uh, in my view, no doubt about this government's commitment to tackling climate change. Uh, what we want to do, however, is make sure it's done in a just way, and I'm sure that the member accepts and understands that there are just transition issues when you have a plan as important to the local economy uh, in terms of employment uh, uh, and, and direct and indirect benefits um, uh, is taken into consideration. I have uh, two short supplementaries, please. Annabelle Ewing, followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. On the important issue of local uh, engagement, would it not be uh, appropriate, Cabinet Secretary, for SEPA to now engage directly with each of the affected community councils in my constituency, being Crossgates and Mosgreen, Hill of Beath, Cowdenbeath, Lumfinnans, Lough Gelly, Kelty, Benarty, Carnden, and as far as Brayfoot Bay is concerned, Aberdare and Dalgetty uh, Bay and Hill End. And when doing so, perhaps SEPA could be encouraged by the Cabinet Secretary to let us all know when it will finally complete its investigation into the hugely disruptive April 2019 unplanned flaring incident at Ms. Morin. Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I need to repeat what I said in my initial response. SEPA is an independent environmental regulator, and I do understand it's currently in the final stages of concluding its investigation into flaring in April 2019. Um, there is a current focus on completing a safe restart of the plant whilst minimising the impact on neighbouring communities and that SEPA will be in a position to conclude their investigation once the start-up of the plant is concluded. Um, I, I hope the member um, is not asking me to interfere with the independence of SEPA. I'm sure she's not, um, but I do understand the frustration uh, while we wait for the outcome of that uh, investigation. A quick supplementary, please, Claire Baker. Um, and as a supplementary to that, would the Cabinet Secretary recognise that while there's an investigation into April, the safe restart has included a, a long period of elevated flaring that has caused a lot of light pollution and noise pollution and distress to the local communities. Um, would she be prepared to engage with ExxonMobil and SEPA to look at the way in which this restart has taken, accepting that there are safety issues that need to be given consideration? Rosanna, can, uh, I... can I thank Claire Baker for that? I'm assured that SEPA and, in fact, the Health and Safety Executive are monitoring developments um, very closely during the plant uh, restart. Uh, regulatory investigations have got to be allowed to take their course, uh, however, um, and uh, uh, the company, as I understand it, are taking steps to reduce the size of the flare uh, and to provide further updates for the local community. I do, however, as I've said earlier, appreciate the concerns and the anxieties of the local community uh, regarding flaring at Moss Morin, and it is important, in my view, that the company takes all reasonable steps to minimise the impact of this on local communities. Question number five, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how rural communities can be supported socially, economically and environmentally from a more robust deer management system designed in the public interest. Marie Gujon. Robust deer management systems can benefit rural communities by reducing the damage caused by deer, such as overgrazing, trampling vulnerable habitats, preventing young trees from growing and damaging crops. 
Wild deer also cause a significant number of road accidents each year and effective deer management systems can help reduce the risk of deer vehicle collisions. The Deer Working Group report on managing wild deer, which we published on the 29th of January this year, sets out a number of recommendations to improve deer management in Scotland. And we'll consider all of these recommendations alongside other evidence and publish our response in due course. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree that many of the rural land management issues we face are made more difficult by knowledge gaps? And will the Scottish Government require a publicly accessible National Deer Cull database as proposed in the Werity report recommendations? Mary Goodjohn. I know that this is a point which has been identified in some of the reports we've carried out, but I mean, we've had the, the Werity report uh, published recently, we've had this report published recently, and I think what we need to do is uh, take a deep and careful look at all the rec recommendations within these reports, take a very careful consideration of them, and exactly establish where those gaps might be, what they are, do we need to fill them, as well as considering that alongside the other recommendations. So that is something we will be giving full consideration to. Question number seven, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to regulate deer numbers. Mary In 2017, we commissioned an independent review by the Deer Working Group. The group's remit was to recommend changes to ensure that we have an effective deer management system in Scotland that safeguards public interests and promotes the sustainable management of wild deer. The group's report, which we published on the 29th of January, contains recommendations on the regulation of deer numbers, and we will carefully consider these recommendations alongside all of their evidence before publishing our formal response. Mike Rumbles. I thank the Minister for that response, but will the Minister also ensure that she engages with the professionals involved in the practical control of deer numbers, that is the Scottish Gamekeepers Association, to ensure that they have a major input into any new system designed to better regulate deer numbers? Marie Goujon. That would absolutely be our responsibility to make sure that we engage with all relevant stakeholders because I realise uh, on the publication of that report there are a lot of people who have also published reports about deer for in, in recent times as well. We've got to consider all that evidence as well as engaging with people as we go forward. So that very is, uh, that very is much part of our plans. Question number eight, Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it supports local authorities in tackling fly tipping. Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, fly tipping is criminal, dangerous and unnecessary. Valuable resources which could be recycled are wasted and local authorities and landowners bear the cost of clear up. Local authorities are primarily responsible for dealing with fly tipping and we provided them with updated guidance on doing so in the revised Code of Practice on Litter and Refuse which was published in 2018. Zero Waste Scotland and the Scottish Partnership Against Rural Crime also provide strategic national support and regional partnerships to assist in tackling fly tipping. Jamie Halcrow Johnson. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I'm sure she'll agree with me that fly tipping remains a considerable problem for rural communities in my region. It's irresponsible, harmful to the environment, and in some cases dangerous. While prevention is, of course, important, the reality is that very few of these crimes, even when detected, make it to court, even in cases where cleanup costs can be considerable. So, with local council budgets under increasing pressure, what can the Cabinet Secretary do to ensure local authorities have the resources to deal with fly tipping and the pursuit of those responsible for it? And where offender is identified, what can she do to make sure that it's more straightforward for local authorities and landowners to recover the costs of cleaning up the mess that's left behind? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, well, I think that question was in two parts. The first has to do with the overall issue of local authority funding, and I'm sure uh, the member will expect me to say what I'm going to say, which is that it is part and parcel of a budget negotiation. Uh, the decision of what money goes to COSLA is negotiated with COSLA, and thereafter uh, there is a decision about local authority, individual local authority funding. And it is therefore then uh, for individual local authorities to make decisions about what they prioritise or otherwise within their own uh, their own budgets. In the broader sense, uh, I, I did make uh, mention, I think, in my uh, opening answer to the Scottish, Scottish Partnership Against Rural Crime, uh, which uh, uh, did publish its rural crime strategy last year. Um, it includes commitments to tackling uh, fly tipping. It involves Police Scotland, Zero Waste Scotland, NFUS, Scottish Land and Estates, Forestry Scotland, amongst others. Um, and uh, uh, since the strategy was launched, there is a number of regional partnerships against rural crime that have been set up. And I don't know whether or not the member has actually managed to engage locally with a regional partnership uh, in his area that would uh, perhaps be a, an interesting first point of contact uh, 
uh, for him. He rightly mentions that there is a difficulty with uh, uh, both detection and enforcement, as there is always uh, with uh, uh, particular crimes that are taking place uh, far away from public eyes uh, and uh, possibility uh, of detection. Um, and uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the necessity of support for local authorities in thinking about how they might press forward in terms of prosecution, uh, the advice will be there, um, and uh, uh, I hope they are all uh, accessing that advice. That concludes the portfolio questions on environment, climate change and land reform. Apologies to Lewis MacDonald for not being able to take his question. We'll move on to the next item of business.